guests drinking beer and partying on a hot summer evening in Chicago. But take a closer look, because this isn't Chicago. This is Qingdao, China, a major resort city on the Yellow Sea, directly west of South Korea, with a population of over seven and a half million. And by the way, that's a medium-sized city by Chinese standards. I'm convinced this stunningly beautiful city with a European flavor will soon be a must-visit destination for American tourists. Hello, I'm WGN-TV reporter and anchor Nancy Liu. When Chicago resident Helen Yang invited me to accompany her on a 10-day trip back to her hometown of Qingdao, I jumped at the opportunity. You can join me on that trip and experience what many call the Asian Riviera. From the air, I can already see it's a beautiful city and it's easy to understand why it's also called the Switzerland of Asia. One of the first things you notice in this city is the German influence. It's everywhere. Especially at the German-built International Club, a popular hangout for students. With the brats and the beer, you'd almost forget you're in China while hanging out here. Xie if not for the Chinese waitstaff. There's good reason for all the German influence. Qingdao was just a fishing village in 1897 when German troops stormed in and took it over in retaliation for two German missionaries killed elsewhere in China. The German occupation ended in 1914 when Japanese and British troops surrounded them and forced a surrender. But the Germans had left much behind. Let's start with a massive steel military bunker called Lookout Tower on Qingdao Hill. As historian Li Ming explained to me, all the cement, iron, and steel required to construct this cavernous underground structure was imported from Germany. It could provide shelter for 2,000 troops with 50 rooms, three levels, and 22,000 square feet of space. The mechanical periscope, pre-built then shipped from Germany, was designed to allow a 360-degree lookout and weighed over 17 tons. Ironically, this command center was never used during World War I, and it is the only intact World War I site in Asia. Now let's get to the beer. I'm talking about the German-influenced beer, better known to drinkers around the world as Qingdao. When German workers built the local railroad and other infrastructure back in the late 1890s, they naturally wanted a drink after work, so why not build a brewery too? While it's spelled differently, it's pronounced the same way the city is pronounced, Qingdao. The original Qingdao brewery has been completely modernized, but its history has been preserved in a museum, and a brewery tour draws hundreds of tourists every day. They're mostly Asian, and of course, German. The brewery tour includes a trip through this drunken house where everyone feels drunk before they've had anything to drink. <laughs> oh, and one more thing. Qingdao's version of a six-pack to go is, well, this. And the German influence doesn't end with beer and bunkers. So what was built by the Germans to be used as city hall here in Qingdao, then used by the Japanese, Chiang Kai-shek, and the People's Republic of China, is now being used by the local Qingdao government. This European Gothic-style structure is the old German governor's mansion, built back in 1908. The opulent Bavarian castle was the official residence of the colonial-era German governor. Once under Chinese control, it was renamed Guest House and became important as a retreat for visiting dignitaries, VIPs, and political figures. The graceful lines, bold colors, and unique ornamentation make this building an architectural gem. The Guest House is now a museum. 
And by the way, those dragons at the top with chains draped around their necks are rumored to symbolize the German control, chains, of the Chinese spirit dragon. With such a big oceanfront playground, of course Qingdao offers all kinds of water sports, for this is the Sailing City. That didn't go unnoticed by the Olympic Committee when they were looking for the right place to hold the 2008 sailing competition. It was a proud moment for Qingdao, and they spared no expense for the opening ceremony. It was, in a word, spectacular. blessed with many inlets and small islands, so there are 450 miles of shoreline, enough for everyone to enjoy. And because the weather is relatively mild, water sports are almost always an option. Parasailing, windsurfing, and if you don't know what you're doing, there are people to teach you. If sailing isn't your speed, Qingdao has what was formerly a naval pier jutting out into the beautiful bay. Jean Xiao Pier was built in 1891 when Qingdao was still under German occupation. Today, it's a favorite spot for a stroll by visiting tourists and locals alike. At the end of the pier, there's a two-storied pavilion named Hui Lai Ko, or Ripple Diverging Pavilion. This iconic structure was built in 1930 and is seen around the world every day. Why? Because it's on the label of every Qingdao beer bottle. The pier is usually packed with vendors, food, and people feeding the hungry seagulls. And it's one of the best places to get a great view of the entire city. And speaking of great views, Xiaoyushan Park, or Little Fish Hill, is just a short distance from the pier. It's characterized by its three distinctive pavilions, perched high on a tree-covered hill and built in the Chinese classical style. Visitors consider it one of the top 10 scenic spots in Qingdao. Another iconic landmark is the Xiaoxingdao Lighthouse. The white marble beacon was, you guessed it, German built in 1900 and served as an important navigation point for ships heading to and from the port. Located on Little Qingdao Isle, also known as Instrument Island, this small piece of land is stunningly beautiful. And it's not the only island just offshore. On a nice day like this, you can see all the way over to Guangdao, a small island with a busy port, a lot of new housing, and even more beautiful beaches. <laughs> Qingdao also has an aquarium, and like our shed, it was built in the 1930s, has been updated, and has kept much of its vintage appearance. And both are pioneering facilities with many firsts. I've spent most of my time on this trip to China exploring sites in the city of Qingdao. Today, though, I'm very excited because we're headed out of the city and up to the mountains to a special place called Laoshan. Laoshan is only an hour's drive outside Qingdao, and yet it feels like a world away. Be ready for a healthy walk, though, which is worth it to see the crystal clear mountain waters. Laoshan, the birthplace of Taoism, was once populated by thousands of Taoist nuns and monks. Taoism emphasizes compassion, moderation, humility, and harmony with nature and the universe. It is said to be the home of supernatural spirits because many centuries ago, Emperor Xin Shi Huang came here to visit so-called supernatural beings. People still say the spring water produced here can cure chronic diseases, and it's also a vital ingredient for Qingdao beer. 
This peaceful spot is a must-see for anyone visiting Qingdao. On the way back to the city, we had a chance to stop at China's first European-style winery located in the fields at the base of Laoshan. This area has long been revered for its apple orchards, but it's gaining a reputation now for the Chardonnay, Rieslings and Reds produced by Huadong Winery. The next day, we visit another spiritual destination, and a unique one too, for China that is. We were allowed to shoot inside Qingdao's St. Michael's Catholic Cathedral. Believe it or not, there are thousands of Catholics in this area. Construction began in 1931 by the German Catholic Missionary Society and was halted in 1933 when Adolf Hitler came to power. He prohibited the transfer of money overseas, so the diocese was forced to independently complete construction, requiring a number of cost-effective design changes. But the church is still beautiful. Hitler wasn't the only trouble looming for St. Michael's. When the Japanese occupied Qingdao in 1942, they slapped a sign on the front door reading, Under Management of the Japanese Army. Eventually, the Chinese government funded a massive restoration, and today services are held for both Chinese and Korean Catholics living here. I've only got a couple of days left in Qingdao, and there are so many more things to explore, so let's start with the shopping. Like any major modern U.S. city, the high-end stores are all here. Hermes, Gucci, Louis Vuitton. But their own stores are far more interesting, offering unique, very Chinese merchandise. Qingdao is also a foodie's paradise. The variety of restaurants, eateries, and food courts is mind-boggling. I've also noticed how extraordinary the presentation and preparation is. The service is excellent, too. I've never had a cup of tea poured like this, and he puts on quite a show afterwards. Speaking of shows, many of the places we visited provided entertainment along with our meal. And if you love seafood, remember, Qingdao is a seaport, and fresh fish is everywhere. I think we've come full circle on this trip as I spend my last night at the Qingdao Beer Festival, the largest beer festival in Asia. The event begins in the second week of August and lasts for two weeks. The grand opening ceremony is spectacular. Come on! Followed by beer tasting, plenty of food, evening entertainment, drinking competitions, and even fireworks blowing out of a giant beer keg. What more could you want? The hometown of the largest brewery in Asia deserves an event of this magnitude, and I, forgive me, drank it all in.